Well, it's like we always said, like my relationship with God, is, uh, it's not private, but it is certainly personal. I don't see him as being human, so you can't have a human relationship with him. I personal relationship with scripture Jesus. There are people who believe that, that uh, uh, what shirt I put on this morning, that, that God cared what shirt I put on. That's nonsense. I do think God is so big and so vast that um, we'll never get to know him exhaustively. I felt like I heard a voice from heaven speak to my situation and tell me that everything was going to be okay. And I've lived a blessed life since then, since turning my life to God. You have to experience it for yourself. I think it's, it's something hard to describe unless you're actually willing, willing to go there. On April 12th, 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man into space. I'm sure some of you will remember that. How many were alive and old enough to remember that event, 1961? Okay. Uh, I was just five years old. I'm tempted to say I wasn't born yet, but I was. And that was big news, if you remember, because uh, of the so-called space race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and also because of the developing Cold War that was happening at that time. But it also made news because of something that Yuri Gagarin was reported to have said when he returned to Earth. And you'll remember what he said, or claimed that he said. He said, I went out into space and I didn't see God there. Now, we know now that the truth is Yuri Gagarin never said those words himself. They were put into his mouth by Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who wanted to capitalize on his uh, fame on Gagarin's fame as a hero uh, by hammering home the Communist Party doctrine at that time. Gagarin actually was baptized into the Russian Orthodox Church and considered himself a Christian, even though he kept his faith largely to himself for obvious reasons. Well, we do know that he did say late in his life, he said, an astronaut cannot be suspended in space and not have God in his mind and his heart. Now, human beings have always looked for God. In every culture and civilization since the beginning of time, there is ample evidence that human beings have looked for, tried to worship, tried to please God, whatever they thought that God or gods to be, whatever they named them, whatever they imagined them to be like. From the ancient Egyptian sun god Ra to Marduk of the Babylonians, to Zeus of the Greeks and Jupiter of the Romans and countless others from the beginning of time. It seems that human beings are uniquely designed, created, hardwired, as if you will, to look for God, hard, hardwired for faith. And despite the prevailing assumption in the Western world that religion as a whole and faith in God in particular is dying out, the truth is the world is actually becoming more religious today than ever before. Even though recent research shows that Christianity and religion in general here in North America is on the decline, that is fewer people consider themselves religious or Christian in North America, Christianity is exploding all over the world. In Asia, South America, and in Africa. Interesting fact, uh, the only religious groups in North America right now that are growing are conservative Protestant organizations like Chapel Street. Now, why? Why would we see that to be true? Well, because Christianity, properly understood, is not primarily a religion at all, not primarily a philosophy, not primarily a system of ethics, not primarily a set of religious rules and practices and rituals. Rather, it's, it's a relationship. Pastor Tim Keller from New York City has written, A person who becomes a Christian moves from knowing about God distantly to knowing about him directly and intimately. Christianity is knowing God. Now, as I said before, today we wrap up our seven-week series called Explore God, and we've looked at six questions over the last month and a half. We've asked, does life have a purpose? Uh, is there a God? Why does God allow pain and suffering? Is Christianity too narrow? 
is Jesus God? And is the Bible reliable? All of which lead us to the question we want to end with, the question we ask today, which is, can I know God personally? Now, of all the places we could go in the Bible to attempt to answer this question, biblically speaking, of all the stories I could look at, the texts we could, we could put before you, I want to focus on one. I, I just want to look at one narrative story out of the life of Jesus. It'll be familiar to a lot of you, but I think there are things in here that will help us answer this question. It comes to us in John chapter 4, in the Gospel of John chapter 4. I'm going to read all the way through this story, and then we'll, we'll back up and see what it teaches us about this question. John is writing. Now, he had to go through Samaria. Let me pause there. He didn't really have to, but he chose to. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Pay attention to that little detail. When, Samaritan, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Uh, Quite possibly the greatest understatement of all time. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit And in truth, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. A familiar story to many of us here today, but a story that's actually packed full of surprises. And at the very center of the story, I think, is the question, Can I know God personally? First, the surprises. First surprise is that Jesus is in the wrong place. Okay, take a look at this map. Uh, Jesus was headed, we know from this part of the Gospel of John, from Judea in the south, see the blue circle at the bottom of the map, and he's headed north to Galilee where his home base was, way at the north, see the blue circle in the north. And the most direct route to go from where he was to where he wanted to go was straight through the region called Samaria. See that green arrow right there? That's the, arrow, that's the direction you would go to go straight to Samaria. The problem is most Jews would not take that route because they had a long-standing uh, conflict culturally and religiously and, and animosity with the Samaritans. So what the Jews would do usually is they would walk around Samaria to get to the northern part. See the little red dotted line? That's the route they would take because they really didn't want to go through Samaria because of the problems they had with the Samaritans. That would be not unlike uh, 
wanting to go to Aurora from where we are right now, and instead of going straight down Randall Road to Aurora, you drove out there through Elburn because you didn't like the people living in Batavia. That's what's happening here. But Jesus stops uh, at a well in Sychar, we're told, smack dab in the middle of Samaria. He's in the wrong place. Any first century Jew reading this story would go, that doesn't make sense, he's in the wrong place. Now the woman, on the other hand, is actually in the right place because she is a Samaritan and that well is in her community. But she's at the well at the wrong time and in the wrong way. John says that when Jesus stops at the well, it's about noon. That's a small but very important detail because in that culture, it was typically the woman's job or role to gather, fetch water for her family. And it was always done first thing in the morning, so your family have water throughout the day. And also, that was the coolest time of the day to do this physical, physically challenging task. It was also kind of a community event. Women would go together to fetch water. And I've traveled a bit around the world, and I've seen this many, many times uh, in the developing world, whether it be in the Dominican Republic or in South America or in rural Africa, you see this, it's a ritual every morning. The women walk to get the water, and they take it back to home. But this woman comes to the well at noon, and she's alone. Jesus would have immediately known that something's wrong with this picture. We're going to look at three things today. First, the search for identity, then the search for God, and then the invitation of Jesus. First, the search for identity. And years ago when I was in seminary, uh, I had to serve a semester as a student chaplain in a large suburban hospital, but to get that role, I had to interview. And the hospital I interviewed, that was a, a large Catholic hospital, and so the person interviewing me was the head of the chaplaincy department there, and he was a priest. Uh, so I walked in, sat down, and he was behind his desk, collar and everything, and he never even looked up at me. Didn't acknowledge me, didn't welcome me, didn't say anything, just didn't even look at me. He was looking at a folder, which I assumed had my information in it. So I sat down, waited for an uncomfortably long period of time, and when he finally looked up at me, he took his glasses off and he said, Brian Coffey, who the heck are you? But he didn't say heck. He said another word. And he was trying to shock me. He was trying to see how I would identify myself. And that began our conversation. We hear a great deal about identity in our world today. Identity theft, identity politics, gender identity. And identity is simply how we think about ourselves. How we understand ourselves. And our identity is shaped by a number of forces in our lives. First, it's shaped by, obviously, our families. Son, daughter, loved, unloved. And in this story... Uh, we don't know much about this woman's family. They're not mentioned except she's had five different husbands. So we can guess there are issues there with family. The second place we get, fam get our identity from is from our, our community. It might be called our tribe, but our community are the people who live around us. Uh, are we accepted? Are we not accepted? Um, are we rich? Are we poor? How are we seen by the people living around us? In this case, this woman uh, we know is already uh, considered an outcast. No one goes with her to draw water. Then we, our identity is shaped by our culture, the larger milieu in which we live. And this woman clearly identifies herself by her culture. She says, you are a Jew. That's your culture. I'm a Samaritan. That's mine. How can you ask me for a drink? And finally, our, our next uh, option is we find our identity in ourselves, by ourselves. And that's actually uh, the prevailing thought in our, our culture today. That is, you can find your own truth, you need to speak your own truth, you need to be your own true self. And that, by the way, is why so many people in our world are confused about identity, because it's impossible to create your own identity. Now, perhaps the, the greatest source of identity is an identity that comes from our Creator, from God Himself. How many of you have heard of a young man named Trevor Lawrence? Anybody? You might recognize this picture. Okay, Trevor Lawrence was a freshman quarterback at the, universe, at the Clemson University who led Clemson to the National College Football Championship by defeating Alabama this past uh, January. Um, now, when you look at that picture, how, what would you guess he thinks about his identity. 
okay, athletic star, big man on campus, Hollywood good looks, right? That's how he's got to identify himself. He's going to be a multimillionaire in a couple years when he's drafted by the NFL. Listen to what Trevor Lawrence says about himself. When he was asked after that game by reporters how he handled the pressure being a freshman in that big game, here's what he said. It really doesn't matter what people think of me or how good they think I play. I put my identity in what Christ says, who he thinks I am. See, the Bible teaches we are created in the image of God. We are created for an eternal relationship with him. And this story tells us that this woman saw herself as a Samaritan, which meant she saw herself as an outcast in the eyes of the Jews, not welcome to worship in Jerusalem. She saw herself as a woman, more than that, as a woman who tried to find her identity in a series of relationships in men. The result was she was an outcast among her own people. No one would even draw water with her. It's likely she also saw herself as an outcast in the eyes of God, assuming that her personal failures had disqualified her from the love of God himself. Now notice, Jesus knows all of this. When Jesus tells her to go and call her husband and come back, she says, I have no husband. Then he says, you are right when you say you have no husband. You have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. Now, there were lots of reasons in the ancient world why a woman would be in that situation. She could have been widowed many times over. She could have been divorced. It was completely in the man's purview to divorce and turn a woman loose. And there were little recourse for a woman other than to find another man to take care of her. But Jesus, whatever the case, puts his finger directly on the pain and loneliness of her heart. He knows who and what this woman is, and he knows how she does not think about herself. Because she does not see herself as known by God. She feels anonymous and unimportant. She does not know that she is loved by God. She feels like she's been disqualified already from his love. She does not feel pursued by God. And she does not know that that's why Jesus walked through Samaria, and stopped at her well. She does not know. And that leads us to the second thing I want to talk about today. That is the search for God. The search for God. Uh, in my student ministry days, I often would, uh, or sometimes would ask high school students and middle school students to draw a picture of how they thought about God and themselves. I said, all you need to do is take a white piece of paper and a pencil, draw you and God in the picture. I just wanted to see how they thought about God, what their image of God was. And I remember uh, one time I did this, I got several really interesting, wildly different uh, views of God. One of the pictures drawn by a young person was uh, God was sitting on a porch in a rocking chair, and he looked like, um, like a, a, an 85-year-old grandfather with a long beard, you know, kind and you know, barely with it anymore, but just rocking on the, ro on the rocking chair on the porch. Uh, then another image was um, the person was a little stick figure way down here at the bottom of the page, and there were these big sort of angry-looking eyes, just eyes staring out of the sky at them, sort of a fearsome, all-seeing God. But the third one was the most interesting, and I, I knew this young man, so it made it more interesting to me. He drew a picture of God God was shooting pool on a billiard table. And if you look closely, all the billiard balls were planets. And God had sort of a smirk on his face. This young man saw God as playing games with the universe. And he was a very cynical young man for, very, for many different reasons. So if human beings are hardwired, designed to look for God, and always have looked for God, how do we know what God is like? Because to know God... We must know something about who God is. I'll never forget, years ago, I baptized a woman right up in the baptistry under the crosses there, and she began her faith story that night by saying, I always just assumed God hated me. I always assumed God hated me. Now, maybe, maybe someone here today has lived a, much of your life or a portion of your life kind of assuming the same thing for whatever reason. I think that's what this woman the Samaritan woman would have felt as she stood at that well that day. She just assumed because of her past failures, her life, 
that God hated her. How do human beings search for God? Well, we search for God, first of all, in religion. I read a little article the other day that claimed that today in the world there are something like 2,400 religions, distinctive religions that you can study. The woman says in verse 20, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She's talking about religion. Religion. The differences between the Jews and Samaritans when it came to worship, or more specifically, the proper place to worship. Later in this conversation, Jesus would say, it's really not about religion. He says, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. What he's saying is, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. Secondly, we search for God in ourselves. Again, our culture teaches us to find your own truth, find your own faith, whatever or whoever you think God is, that's true for you. The trouble is, when we do that, the God we create ends up looking a whole lot like ourselves. Thirdly, we can search for God in idols, what I would call idols. Human beings need something to worship, something to put at the top of our priority chart. And often we will substitute lesser things in place of God, like money, success, our favorite sports team maybe. So how can we know who God is? Well, think about it for a minute. How do we know another person? Well, we spend time with them. We listen to what they say. We watch what they do. We experience how they act toward us. And gradually, we get to know them. Well, in a similar way, that's how we get to know God. By what he has said, that's by looking at his word. We covered the Bible as reliable last week. By what he has done from creating the world to entering into that world through what's called the incarnation, taking on flesh in the person of Jesus, to the cross and the resurrection. We know something about God by what he has done. And then by how he acts toward us and that leads us back to the story verse 7 when a Samaritan woman came to draw water Jesus said to her will you give me a drink his disciples had gone to the town to buy food the Samaritan woman said to him you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman how can you ask me for a drink and then in the parentheses there for Jews do not associate with Samaritans now the woman is astonished that Jesus a Jewish man would ask her for a drink. When the disciples get back later in the story, they are shocked to find Jesus standing there talking to a woman. In fact, they're so shocked that they're verklempt. They can't even say anything because it's so embarrassing. Nobody asks. Nobody's going to say anything because this is weird. This is uncomfortable. First, because a Jewish man would just not initiate a conversation with a woman who was not his wife. It was culturally um, inappropriate especially with a Samaritan woman. Second, a Jewish man would not ask for a drink in a million years because that would mean he would have to drink out of her bucket. And the Jews believed the Samaritans were unclean. This would be like me coming to your house and asking you if I could sip out of your dog's bowl. It's exactly the same thing. And that's the reaction that a Jew would have had to this story. Like, no, no. And yet Jesus initiates He walks right through the social, cultural, and religious barriers of the day. He moves toward this woman. Why? Because he does not identify her the way she identifies herself. He does not see her as she sees herself. He does not see her as the rest of the world sees her, as her own culture sees her. He sees her the way he sees her. Not just a Samaritan. Not just a woman. Not just a woman who's a five-time failure in relationships. Not just a woman who's an outcast who is far from God. He sees a person created in the image of Almighty God. A person that he loves. A person that matters deeply to him. A person who is lost and lonely and thirsty. A person trying to satisfy the thirst of her own soul through relationship after relationship. And her thirst is a deeply spiritual thirst. She's searching for God. 
She's looking for love. She's looking for forgiveness. She's looking for hope. And she does not yet know that God has come to her. See, if we want to know what God is like, we just look at Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus says, Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Literally, in the language used to write this, it is I am the one speaking to you. Here's another surprise, a shock. And we, we miss it in, in our language because we don't know the culture and the history. But I am, that phrase, is the ancient name of God. Yahweh, Jehovah, I am that I am. Jesus is saying to her, I am the God who created you in the beginning. I am the God who shaped you, who knows you, who loves you, who offers you the gift of living water. I am the one you're looking for. That leads us to the third part in this story that I'm calling the invitation of Jesus. The invitation of Jesus. Years ago, my wife and I um, were invited to uh, spend a weekend at uh, a cottage in Wisconsin that belonged to friends of ours in the church. And just taking our boys up there for a weekend of boating, tubing, and just fun, relaxation and all. But before we went, they told us that while we were there, uh, we had to go to uh, the well, I think they called it, just the well. Well, what's the well? They said it was, there's this artesian spring just outside town that has the, the, the best water in the world comes from that well. So you have to, you have to go to that well. And they actually left a, an, an empty bottle for us to go collect the water. You can make your coffee out of it. It's, just a, it's the best water in the whole world, they said. They pretty much pretty much made us promise that while we were there, we would go to this well. Um, I'm going to come back to that story in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Look at verse 10 here. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Then in verse 13, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So what Jesus is saying What's the invitation? He's using the image of water, that which every human being needs to live. Yeah, I think you, 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 can, uh, you can live longer without food than you can live without water. That's why we're involved with life water in Africa. He's using that image to talk about something far more important, what he calls living water, that which brings new hope and new life, eternal life. What he's offering is transformation. He wants to change her understanding of God. Not God as as distant and unreachable, but God as near and personal. He wants to change her understanding of herself. Not unlovable, not unknown, not rejected, but rather deeply loved and fully known. He wants to change her the trajectory of her life and the eternal destiny of her soul. And by the way, this is the same invitation that he offered Nicodemus in the previous chapter, John chapter 3. Nicodemus was not a woman. He was a man. He wasn't a Samaritan. He was a Jew. He wasn't a five-time failure in relationships. He was one of the most religious men of his day. And Jesus makes the same exact offer. You must be born again, he says. You couldn't have two more different people. And God makes the same invitation through Jesus to both of them. How to respond to the invitation. How do we respond? Well, the same way we respond to any invitation. Birthday party, wedding, graduation party. We accept or we reject. We accept or we reject. How do we accept? Well, it takes faith, by faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11 tells us, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So faith is 
assurance, conviction, confidence that leads to trust. And every human being is capable of faith. We all have faith. For example, I don't know how airplanes work. I don't know how elevators work, for that matter. I don't know how cars work. But I get in them because I trust that they'll work. Or think about marriage. 33 years ago now, I stood in front of people, family and friends, and said, I do. Now, I didn't know everything about marriage at that time. I couldn't see into the future and know what 30 years would bring. All I had was trust in that woman. So I said, I do. Jesus is inviting this woman to trust that he was who he said he was. To trust that he could deliver what he promised he could deliver. Living water, eternal life, relationship with God. He was asking her to trust him on the basis of two things. First, that he knew her. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. He knew her and she mattered to him. This one outcast Samaritan woman, five-time failure in relationships, mattered to him. When it comes to faith, I've learned over the years that there are really two pathways to faith. Some people, I think, most people, I think, feel their way into faith. That is, they hear something, a sermon, they see something, a sunset, they feel something, and they just open their hearts, and then they figure it out intellectually later. I think that was this woman. Jesus' invitation was so personal and so surprising to her, and his love was so real, she just opened her heart and she believed, and later she figured it out. However, there are other people who I think think their way into faith. These are the folks that have question after question after question. They need to see evidence. They need to know. They need to understand. And this journey's a little longer, I think. And that's why we've spent seven weeks talking about Explore God. Whether the journey starts in your head with questions or in your heart with emotion, eventually we all need both evidence and trust. Back to our friends who invited us to Wisconsin. Um, when they told us that we really should go to this well, we had a series of decisions to make. You know, did we believe them that it really was this awesome water? Um, did we believe the well was really there? Were we willing to drive the six or seven miles to where the well was located? Uh, were we willing to drink the water once we captured it? And we knew that they were going to ask us when we came home, did you go to the well? So the last day we were there, we took the bottle and we drove to follow the directions and found, tried to find this well. And there it was. Just a pipe sticking out of the ground with water flowing out, just, just spilling out into the ground. And there's a little sign next to the well. And the sign said, this well was dug by a local farmer named Adam Channing in 1895 and has been flowing ever since. 40 gallons a minute, 60,000 gallons a day for over 120 years. Crystal clear, ice cold, absolutely free. And it struck me standing there that for my entire lifetime, and for my parents' entire lifetime, and my grandparents' entire lifetime, that water's been flowing out at that rate 24-7, 52 weeks a year. All we had to do was receive it. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me now as I move toward closing. There are really three ways we can respond this morning to this story. First is you've already trusted Jesus, already accepted his invitation personally. Just, just thank him. Thank him and then ask him to help you share that. Share that with others. Or, secondly, you may know someone in your life, a friend or a loved one, who is kind of like the Samaritan woman, maybe, maybe far from God, maybe struggling in their life in some way, maybe drinking from wells that just do not satisfy. And today you can pray for them that they would encounter the one who meets them at their point of need. Or maybe you're kind of like the Samaritan woman yourself, 
That is, you just sort of assumed that God is kind of unreachable, that maybe you've done something that, that disqualifies you from his love. But today you realize that he has come to you. And you want to receive. You want to say, yes. Yes, I trust you. I want your living water. And that's all you have to say today in your heart. Yes, I trust you. Lord, we thank you for this ancient story, a story that's really so contemporary. Thank you for showing us that faith is not primarily religion or theology or philosophy. It's personal. It's a relationship. So thank you for showing us that we can know you because you knew us first, that we can love you because you loved us first. Thank you for your invitation. Help us to say yes. Yes. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.